All right, let's let's get started here. Um, hey, what is everybody? We got carpet, huh? So that was kind of amazing. How many? How many first time seeing the carpet today? Yeah, it was, it was all of a sudden like boom, it was, it's done, right? Uh, the carpet laying crew they did a fabulous job. I think they got everything stripped by Monday at two o'clock. Everything was stripped by Monday at two o'clock, and then they had probably half of it laid by Monday Monday late evening. That was pretty pretty amazing. Um, what I find so amazing with this is that they come in squares. So if I spill my coffee and ruin it really bad, guess what? We pull one square up and we what? Replace it. Yep, good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, let's have a word of prayer, then we'll jump into things, and uh, we'll, we'll tackle our subject for the day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word to us. We thank you for the gifts that you give us, such as this building, so that we have a place of, of climate control, that we can actually uh, peacefully hear your word and to be delivered assurance. Bless our conversation today. Thank you for this church family here at St. Paul's. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Acts 26. Before we get to Acts 26, I'm going to throw an idea out to you. <clears throat> two things, actually, two ideas. First is this. What I'd like to do, um, I've, I've actually never done this with a church before, but I think it would be a lot of fun to do. I've actually done this with individuals before, and that is to go into the sanctuary and take our hymnal and walk through the hymnal page by page and discuss why we're doing and what we're doing. And so... For instance, uh, when I stand up there, um, these are questions that when I first joined the Missouri Senate, okay, now keep in mind, when I first joined the Missouri Senate, I had no idea how to put an all bond, okay? And so, you know, they have these clergy shirts, they have these clergy tabs, and they also have the one that has the white thing all the way around. Now, the reason why I didn't go with the one white thing all the way around is I was too embarrassed to ask the person that, that I was buying it from how to put it on. <laughs> I'm like, I looked at this, I'm like, I think I can figure this out. But that other thing, there was a big round thing, and there's all these clips, and I'm like, that just... And so I was too embarrassed to even ask um, how, how to actually put one of those on, so I got this one. And, uh, <laughs> and I remember putting an all bond, and I think I've told you that story before, putting an all bond, how the one time I was at this, this uh, installation, and um, I was putting this all bond, and all the other guys are kissing their stoles and praying these prayers, and literally my arm and my head get stuck in the arm of the all <laughs> And I'm like this, and, and yeah, so anyway, um, so when I, when I joined the Missouri Senate, I, I didn't know much of anything, and it's like, well, you're going to have to stand up front, where do you stand, right? And then why do you stand there? And then I noticed all the pastors, sometimes they'd face the congregation, sometimes they'd have their back to the congregation. Why do you do that? And, and so then what happened was, um, I got some good training, um, uh, specifically from um, my good friend Sean Danzer. Uh, Sean is, is now at the International Center, wonderful guy. Uh, he's a liturgical, uh, just absolutely liturgical. He knows ins and outs back and forth. So uh, Sean, I went over to Sean's uh, little church in Barney once upon a time, and uh, he took me through the whole service a couple times, and I asked him, okay, how do you hold your hands? Why do you hold your hands that way, right? How do you walk? Why do you walk that way? When do you, you know, when we bow, why are we bowing there? And so I thought, okay, that'd be kind of fun to go through as a church. Um, it's always fun for me to go through, but I think it'd be fun for all of us to go through and um, take Divine Service Setting 3, 184, and just go through it. I don't know. Thoughts on that? Okay. Well, I don't give you much of a choice. I'm like, good idea. You're like, yeah, Pastor. Can you believe that? That, 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 that was a terrible idea, but no one had the courage to say it, you know? Well, my wife gave me a thumbs up. She would have told me otherwise, you know? So, um, I'll give you a little example. And this is one thing I, I didn't know. And this was really, this is really, I'm just a small little thing. And this is something that Sean shared with me. Um, you know, the section where, where, where the pastor turns to you and says to you, the Lord be with you, right? Okay? And it's like, it's like a ping pong match, right? The Lord be with you. Ping! And he serves, you know. And then you what? You bounce back. The Lord, and also with thy spirit. So Sean was sharing with me, that's actually like a mini ordination. It happens twice in the service. Actually three times in the service. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. In other words, you are affirming my ordination before I preach the word to you. And so if I say, Lord be with you, and, and nobody says, and with thy spirit, then guess what? There's no Christians in the, in the pew, so then I should what? 
Just go home. Yeah. So if you ever, if the Vikings are ever playing, let's just say the Vikings are having a spectacular season, something which will never happen. But uh, <laughs> Jen's not here. Is she? Where's Jen? Okay, good. Otherwise, I'd, I'd have a coffee being thrown at me right now. Uh, if if the Vikings are having a stellar season, we just knew we need to get home. You can all get together for the 10:30 service. Say, hey, let's get home early. When Pastor says, "Lord be with you," nobody say anything, and I'll say, "Lord be with you," and it's crickets, and I say. Shut my book and we go home, right? Um, because what you're doing as a church, you're affirming my ordination and affirming me. You're basically saying, I'm saying, the Lord be with you. In other words, hey, is anybody here? And you're just like, yeah, we're here, Pastor. Keep going. Okay? So, the Lord be with you. We're here. <laughs> okay? So it's an affirmation, right? And so that happens right before the preaching of the word. It also happens where? Before the sacrament. You're affirming, yep, we want the sacrament too. And then it happens again a third time before that great blessing where the, fa- where the pastor blesses you at the end of the service. So you're basically saying to the pastor, we want you to give us good gifts. We want to hear the word. Yes. Yes, pastor, we want to receive the what? The sacrament of the altar. Yes, Lord. Yes, pastor, please bless us in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're asking the pastor to what? Keep on going. And so if I don't get that, guess what? I don't have the authority to keep on going. Right? Okay? Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, but then I feel that uh, as a Christian, uh, I love Jesus. I'm not going to take that long. I'm not going to yeah. take Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing. is, is, is and Who as a Christian is not going to say what? Don't give me the gifts. Right? But, but technically, that's what's going on. Right? And so... So today, Marlene, when I say, the Lord be with you, you can say, we're here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. That makes sense. Okay. So I think, okay, I'm going to talk with Scott because I had a visit with Scott next door, um, next door, yeah, in the sanctuary. Uh, I know he teaches the confirmation there. And we'll maybe shoot for maybe next week or the week after. I'll try to keep you guys posted, okay, what we're doing. And I need a little more research on it. And we'll have a lot of fun with that. Okay. And, it, and if you have any questions as we go through, if you ask me a question I don't know, I'm just, I'll, I'll just say I don't know. And we'll write it down. We can, you know, I'll call Sean afterwards. Okay? Okay? All right? So neat stuff. All right, so what are we doing today? We're doing Acts 26. Um, we're almost done with the book of Acts. So we have, Acts has, what, 28? Is it 28? Yeah, 28 chapters. So we could potentially be done by the end of May. So that means not next week, but the week after, we're going to have to decide where we're going next. Okay? So this is a way to review. What have we gone through before in here? We've gone through Ecclesiastes. Uh, Ecclesiastes, we went through the book of what? Romans. Okay? We went through 1 John. What else did we go through? I'm trying to think. Um, Acts. Acts was a great decision. Uh, you guys, yeah, it's great. I'm really glad you chose Acts. I wasn't too excited about it at first. I'm like, ah, but I'm like, I'm really glad we went through it. I really am. So thank you for that. Um, men's Bible study we've gone through. Now, if we've done it in a men's or women's Bible study, that's absolutely fine. We can still do it here, too. We've gone through 1 Corinthians with the men. We've gone through Gospel of Mark with the men. We've gone through First and Second Timothy and Titus with the men. Um, and same with the ladies. We've gone through First and Second Timothy and Titus with the ladies. So just be thinking it through, okay, um, what you want to go through as, as, as a group. Um, yeah, so in the back of your mind. Okay, so in a couple of weeks, we'll try to decide that, okay? So if you have a real strong conviction, start campaigning now. So you've got two weeks to campaign for your book of the Bible, okay? All right? Sound like a plan? Okay, so Acts 26, 1 through 32. Now, it's a longer chapter, 32 verses. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to just kind of, if you open your Bible and you look at it, I'm just going to kind of do an outline of it and read certain sections of it, okay? Now, keep in mind, <clears throat> so keep in mind, uh, the accusations were coming against Paul, and so Paul is proclaiming the gospel. Paul is, is talking about the resurrection of the dead. Now, when he talked about the resurrection of the dead, okay, he was also then affirming at the same time, if he's talking about the resurrection of the dead, he's also affirming what? The resurrection of who? Of Christ. So <clears throat> we understand that Christ is the first fruits, right? That he is resurrected first. And so how do we know that we will be raised? Because Christ, what? He was raised himself. In fact, Paul says this in um, one of his letters. He says that if Christ is not risen from the dead, we are most to be what? Pity. So if you think about this, how atheists 
how they treat Christians, it's actually quite, um, how do we say this, problematic for them. Because what they often do is they often come across very scornful and very aggressive towards Christians. And if you really think about it, if we Christians are out of line or we're misinformed that Christ was not raised from the dead, then the last thing that we would actually need is what? Scorn. We should have the greatest amount of sympathy because what Paul says we are most to be pitied. So the, the, the fact of the matter comes down to this. Either Christ was what? Risen from the grave or we're to be what? Pitied. We're to be fooled. Now, just a brief pause there. Think of that for a second. Christianity has the, in, in of itself, Christianity has the ability, right, to be disproven, if you will. All you have to do is show forth what? The body of Christ. Think about that compared to the Islam or, Islam or Jehovah Witnesses or Mormons, especially Mormonism, right? You can't, there's, there's, no, there's no way to actually challenge Mormonism because it's based upon Joseph Smith seeing what? Some of these golden plates with the angel Mirani and doing all of this stuff. And so you can't, you can't what? You can't go at it. You know, you can't go at it. There's no way of what? Going at it. Where Christianity is definitely grounded in time and place and context. We know about Christ, not only from our scriptures, but we have uh, uh, quite a few documents. Uh, Tactius, we have Josephus, we have, um, um, i trying to think of a couple other ones. Uh, there's a bunch of historical documents out there that actually talk about Christ. Josephus does as well. This is a Jewish historian. So we know for a fact that Christ existed, right? And so whereas with the uh, uh, Mormon religion, we don't have anything external to even affirm that. And if we want to challenge it, there's no way we can challenge it. Whereas Christianity is grounded in time and place and fact. Okay? So Christianity, my point is, Christianity is not an ethereal ideology. It's, it's grounded in a real person, a real time, real context. Okay? So Paul is talking about what? The resurrection. And they're so offended by him because if the resurrection is true, as he says then he's basing that resurrection of the Christian upon who? Christ. And if Christ rose from the dead, what does that say about the Jewish leadership and the Jews at that time? They were wrong. That they were dead wrong. And do people like to be wrong? No. And so this is a defense of their wrongness to justify themselves, and they're going down the road of trying to what? Censure Paul and shut him up. And Paul will not what? He won't shut up, and so they're trying to kill him. Right? They're trying to kill him. So, long story short, remember he was in the temple. They're going to kill him. The Romans interceded. They, they took him to his barracks. And then now we're going up that food chain of authority. Uh, we're going all the way up from Felix up to up all, all Paul's defense, up to Agrippa and so forth. So you have this huge defense where Paul is appealing to his Roman citizenship uh, for a fair trial. So we get to chapter 26, verse 1, and this trial has been going on for quite some time, where Paul, you think Paul would be getting tired of repeating the thing, same thing over and over and over, but nonetheless he is. In chapter 26, verse 1, Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and began to defend himself. Now first of all, we'll just real quickly there, we'll talk about this briefly. It's neat to see that there's what? Due process. Okay, that He's given a right to defend himself. Um, as a way I mentioned, due process, the innocent until proven guilty, that is rooted in Christian ethics. Which Christian ethic is that rooted in? The Eighth Commandment. So the innocent until proven guilty is directly tied to the Eighth Commandment. The Eighth Commandment says that we what? Put the best construction on people, right? And it's what? Not to give false testimony. So we automatically, anytime we hear something, we're assume the best first and go from there. That's where due process and innocent until proven guilty is directly tied to our Christian ethics of the Eighth Commandment. That makes sense? And so when people violate due process and they jump to the conclusion of guilty until proven is innocence, they're going directly against what? The Eighth Commandment. So we see that in our culture. We've seen that in our, in our culture. Um, I'm just going to say this, but and this is not probably popular in our world. But one of my contentions with the uh, um, oh the 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 the, uh, the the movement of of against 
toxic masculinity, they said. The Me Too, was it Me Too, was it? Mm-hmm. Yep. My, my, my contention with Me Too is not that there are not bad men out there. There are bad men out there. There are toxic men out there. That men who are selfish and live for themselves, and men who do not know how to suffer for a woman. Okay? So we need to affirm that. But my problem with the Me Too movement was what? They violated what? They violated the Eighth Commandment by assuming guilty until proven what? Innocent. All it would take is one accusation from a woman, and a man's career was what? Destroyed. And that is not right. Now, even if he is guilty, there needs to be due process, and there has to be following the Eighth Commandment. Okay? And so we see here with Paul, there's what? Permission to speak. So we say, well, God be praised that he's given an ability to what? Defend himself. Okay? So then what we see here, and we're going to kind of peruse through this, verse 2, and all the way up to verse 8, uh, what he does here, he establishes uh, that he's not a part of a sect. He's establishing his history, that he's not what? A loon. Okay? That he's not nutty. And then we look at verses 9 through 11. He talks about his past enmity, his past struggle, his past aggression towards Christianity. So he talks about his history, how he was on the same side of those Jews that are persecuting him, that he was right there too, that he was persecuting Christians. So he gives us a little bit of his what past, his history, that he's not what a loon, that he's not a part of a sect. Then verses 9 through 11, he shares his history about how he was against Christ and his people. And then in verse 12, okay, so if you look at the Bible, verse 12 through 18, Paul then talks about his conversion, okay? So remember his conversion back from Acts chapter 8 to 9 in that area, his conversion. Then in verse 19, okay, then in verse 19, he has a conclusion, okay? And he goes on verse 21, he says, For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me, okay? Um, to this day, I have had, I've had to help I've had help from God, and so I stand here testifying to both small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would take place, that the Messiah must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Okay? So he's there defending the same thing. And then we look at verse 24. While he was making this defense, Festus exclaimed, You are out of your mind, Paul. Too much learning is driving you insane. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I'm speaking the sober truth. Okay? And then he goes on, Indeed, the king knows about these things, and to him I speak freely, for I am certain that none of these things has escaped his notice. But this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Agrippa said to Paul, Are you so quickly persuading me to become a Christian? Paul replied, whether quickly or not, I pray to God that not only you, but also all who are listening to me today might become such as I am, except for these chains. Okay? And then uh, the king gets up and he basically says, you know, in conversation, this man has done nothing wrong to deserve death. Okay? So. Pastor, I believe that if somebody is challenging me, telling me that, and I'm like that, I believe that that's God's work. Yeah, you know, think about that. It's a good point that Marlene's making there. Uh, typically what happens is when there's conflict, oftentimes that conflict gives way to confession, to confess the, confess the truth like Paul did. Okay, so let's look at our sheet here, okay? Let's look at our sheet here, and we'll kind of try to pull this all together for a theme for today. <coughs> it is encouraging to see the due process given to Paul, which we already talked about. He was given the floor to speak in his own defense. But what did Paul say? Now, as a way of summarizing, which we already did, Paul first establishes his history and his credentials to show that he's not crazy or part of a nutty sect. Secondly, Paul lays out his confession of his past mistakes. This confession not only shows forth a layer of humility, but also shows Paul's history of being on the opposing side. Thirdly, Paul speaks of his conversion from the opposing side of the truth of Christ. And finally, Paul offers a conclusion to his predicament. Now, what can we specifically glean from Paul's defense here? Though verse 25, you look at verse 25, is spoken by Paul in response to an attack by Festus, nonetheless it seems to capture the disposition of Paul throughout this whole chapter. 
In other words, Paul spoke true and reasonable words. How do you have that translated in your Bible? Paul spoke what? True and reasonable words. So I have it translated here that he, I'm speaking the sober truth. Does anybody have it translated differently in your Bibles? Speak freely. Speak freely? Yep. Sober truth. That he's speaking what? Reasonable and true? True and rational. True and rational. Okay. True and rational. Okay. So that's the theme we want to look at here. Okay. So Paul spoke truth. He did not speak lies. And he did so reasonably, soberly. I love the word sober. Sober means what? In the moment. Right? Paul uses that word all the time. And he doesn't necessarily use it to refer to what? Drunkenness. He's using it to what? Talking about being alert. To be sober. To be in the moment. To be present. Okay? So to be sober and to be in the moment is like when my wife will look at me and she's like, Hello, are you hearing me? And I'm like, and I'm thinking about what? Knives or something else, right? You know, I'm thinking about maybe a... a, a, a she's like, Hello, are you here? I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 I'm here. No, no, you're not. I can tell you're thinking about something else, right? To be what? Sober is to be what? In the moment, right? Guys, you can relate to that, I'm sure. So considering truth, it is important to understand that when a person speaks truth, they are testifying to reality, the way things are or are not. They're stating what is and what is not, not what they want and don't want. And so truth is not burdened with various rhetorical devices. Truth does not need voice inflection. It does not need stimulation or affection or persuasion. Truth is free from needing all of these things. Okay? Uh, I'm sure you've been in arguments before with individuals. <clears throat> and and um, I, I know for myself, there's, and I can't think of anything particular, but I can think of the demeanor that... Um, when there's an argument, sometimes you get really amped up on an argument and you want to what? Try to convince. And other times when it's like, you know, no, this is the way it is. This is what's true. You don't get amped up. You're just like, this is, this is how it is. I, 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 I don't need to, you know, raise my voice. I don't need to what? Stomp my feet. I don't need to try. It's just, I'm sorry, but this is, this is how it is, right? That's what truth does because you're what? Speaking to reality. And so we get the impression in what Paul is simply saying here is like, what can I tell you? The, 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 the tomb, it's, it's empty. You know, it, it's empty. It's true. It's, I'm sober. I'm, I'm clear-minded. Not insane, Festus. Um, I'm not overcome by book learning. It's just the tomb is empty. It's kind of cool, huh? Yeah. And fight everybody else's battles. I, Jesus, won my battles. Yep. Argue with anybody. I'm at peace because I know the truth. You know, Virginia is absolutely right. Think about this from this perspective. Bill and I, what she's saying. Jesus says, well, I'm the way, the truth, and the light. Truth is not an idea. Truth is a person. And so when we confess truth, we're confessing Christ. And I think this is something that we can all learn as Christians. I know in my younger years as a Christian, somebody would insult Christianity, and oh boy, my, my temper would rise up, my old hockey temper. I'd be, oh, who do they think they are? They're attacking the Christian faith. And well, they're not attacking Matt Richard, right? Matt Richard is nobody. I'm just what? I'm a blimp, right? I'm a, what? You know, if I make it 80 years, right? If I make it, if if I make it 80 years, that I'll be, you know. God be praised, right? Uh, but 80 years within what? Thousands of years is nothing. Okay? I must have said something silly. You're like, blip, not blimp. <laughs> <laughs> so I sometimes get these words, I could talk, and I, I, I called Serenity once. Um, so you guys know what the word prude is? Yeah? We, we had a fight once, Mrs. Richard and I, and I looked at her and I said, Why are you always such a prune? <laughs> She started giggling. She said, prune? Am I all shrivelly? No. Prune, prune. Blip. Blip, right? Did I say blimp? <laughs> Oops. Okay. All right. So, but I'm what? Just a little speck compared, right? So, so truth is not dependent upon Matt Richard. And by the way, truth is not dependent upon St. Paul's. Okay? God can survive without this church, without this church body. He doesn't need us. 
Truth is bigger than us. And so what that does is that should offend our old Adam a little bit, that we're just not that important. But at the same time, it sets us free, right? Just what Virginia says. If you have a problem with truth, talk to Jesus. Uh, he's the one that rose from the grave. You know, don't take it up with me, right? So it's awesome. Okay, so it's been said before that lying is more mentally difficult than telling the truth. Maybe you've heard that before. The reason why... Lying demands the brain to not only adjust words towards the lie, but lying also pushes the brain to consider things such as intonation, body language, emotion. For example, if something happened that is sad, and a person is going to lie and communicate that something happened that is good, then they will have to change their intonation, body language, and words to be happy, not sad. And so all of this takes a considerable amount of effort Furthermore, once a person lies, they have to fill in all the other cracks in the story to make the narrative work. That is to say, if a person lies about a portion of a story, it will affect the other portions of the story, produce cracks in the narrative. With each lie, consequently, there will be multiple cracks in the narrative that will need to be filled with additional lies. As a result, the more lies a person tells, not only will they become exponentially exhausted, but they will often compensate with various techniques to strengthen the so-called validity of their lie. Change in speech patterns, conflicting body language, rise or fall in voice tone, shifting eyes. With respect to Paul, though, he simply spoke the truth. What was and what was not. And in so doing, his demeanor was sober, self-controlled, calm, and sane. He had nothing to cover up, nothing to twist, nothing to manipulate. Okay? Does that make sense? So I remember watching a spy movie once, and they were training this guy. To, I don't I have no idea which movie this was, but I just remember the scene. This, this old spy was teaching a younger spy how to be a good spy. And so he goes, okay, let's do some role playing. And the young spy goes, you know, starts telling a story. And he goes, uh, he goes you just lied three times. He goes, well, I'm a spy. He's like, no, no. As a spy, the goal is to tell the truth as much as possible. Because as soon as you tell three lies, now you have to remember those three lies in your head. And now those three lies are going to affect other parts of your story that you're going to have to compensate for. And then you're going to have to, what, cover up with your emotions and all these other things to deal with those lies. Right? And so lying takes a ton of energy, whereas speaking the truth is what? Simple. Sober clear-minded and it's consistent right and we see that over and over with Paul right he's like tombs empty Jesus is risen from the dead deal with it he's Lord he's the one that was promised from the Old Testament people come up and say what what did you say Jesus is risen from the dead he's the one this prophet spoke of he is Lord people are like, what on earth did you say Paul Paul what are you saying Jesus is risen it's the same thing right because it's the truth he doesn't have to negotiate or change it and that is what the church does. That is what we do on Sundays. We simply, we simply confess over and over and over again the truth of the gospel. Okay? And we don't have to what? Convince or fancy it all up. Okay? That makes sense? So, pause there. What thoughts? Brains turning here? Making sense? I think we all know this because even if, you know, even if we don't struggle with lying right now, you know, as kids, we all did as kids, and you can definitely tell with kids, right? Mom and dad, well, da, 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 you know, da, 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 and then you're like, really? Yeah, and it intensifies, right? You can always tell with the kid when they intensify the, the, the you know, mom, dad, right? You know, it intensifies, right? So, okay, makes sense. What does this mean for us as a church, though, to walk in the footsteps of Paul? What does it mean just to confess? Is there is there a combativeness? Do we have to be aggressive? Do we have to be, you know, pick it, looking to pick a fight? So did Paul go around looking to pick a fight? It comes to us. Yeah. <clears throat> generally speaking, generally speaking, the fight comes to us, historically speaking. So you think about the Old Testament, Cain and Abel, right? Uh, Genesis chapter 4. Um, who killed... Abel. It's Cain. Cain brought the fight to Abel. 
Luther talks about this a lot. Martin Luther talks about this a lot. He talks about the church of Abel will always be persecuted by the church of what? Cain. And we see the church of Cain throughout all the Old Testament. We think of Jezebel, church of Cain. We think of the Pharisees, church of Cain. We think of the 1500s, the Roman Catholic Church in the 1500s, the church of Cain. They were always persecuting the church of Abel. And that will always happen. Paul, right here, versus the, the Jewish elite. Cain and Abel. The church of Cain persecuting the church of Abel. And the church of Abel is poor, beggarly, weak. And the church of Abel just simply says, I've got nothing. Christ has it all. And I just confess Christ. It is what it is. It's truth. Right? Sometimes and, you, you, know, you can feel the uh, interpret a conversation in a different way. Too. Yeah. <clears throat> And perhaps something your dad did would you discuss or, or family commitment to argue or something. Yeah, sometimes we have to keep in mind that with conflict, it can become a personal conflict as well. And, and the issue is not always the issue. Which brings us into this next part here we're going to talk about right now, which is a good, good segue. It says, keep in mind that while there are definite times to use rhetoric and other techniques regarding the defense of the Christian faith, there are times for doing that. When push comes to shove, the Christian faith is based upon reality. The reality, i.e. truth, can and should be said with sober reasonableness. Christ lived, died, and rose. In the case of Paul, Festus conducted what we call an ad hominem attack upon Paul, accusing him of being insane and out of his mind. Now, an ad hominem attack is attacking the person's character or motivation rather than the message, or the argument, or the logic. Festus attacked Paul's character and not Paul's message. So we all have done this. We all have done ad hominems, and we've all experienced ad hominems. Ad hominems is just a, it's a fancy word for a logical fallacy, which is this. If you're going to get an argument with somebody, and you're arguing about, um, let's just do something fun for sports. Let's just say you're arguing which one's better, the Green Bay Packers or the Vikings, right? And you're going back and forth, and you're arguing which team is better maybe in the season. And let's just say um, you are on the Green Bay Packers fan, fan, and let's just say the other person is winning the argument. Let's just say the Vikings are having that great season. And they're winning that argument. And partway through the argument, you, you, you get frustrated, and instead of staying on the content, you look at them and say, well, you know, maybe you're talking to another guy, well, color purple is for girls, right? You know, or, 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 or something silly like that. Or, or, the, or maybe the Minnesota Vikings say, well, at least our stadium has a roof, you know, you know, uh, you know on, and, and it's just, you know, or the color green is, you know. So when you go to what? Something else other than the content itself, you go down the road of what we call an ad hominem. So what did Festus do to Paul here? Paul's confessing, and Festus goes, what? You're out of your mind. So he, he goes around the content of the message. He goes around and he attacks what? The message, the person. Now this can happen in many aspects of life. You turn on our news, whether it's MSNBC, Fox News, or CNN, they are always doing this in politics, right? They're always doing this in politics. They go around and they attack the character of the person. Now. I'm going to point one out here, a couple of these things out. So on both sides that do it. So I can recall many, many times with President Trump, they would go and they would criticize his hair. My question is, what does his hair have to do with what? Policy. Absolutely nothing. And I remember a while back, there was, there was a bunch of criticism against Nancy Pelosi about her choice of ice cream or whatever, something about ice cream. And I don't remember, the, but I'm, I, I just, I heard that. I'm like, what does her ice cream have to do with what? Policy. Uh, maybe there is a connection. I don't know. Maybe I'm not smart enough to get it. But, but, but the point being is we're always going to the character of the person. And if you can go to the character of the person, then you can actually diminish the argument. You're pulling the what? The rug out from underneath. You what? Excuse me? Yep, causing doubt. Yep. Um, this is something that happens with everyone in leadership. Okay? 
This typically happens with everyone in leadership. Uh, it has happened numerous times over the last 20 years for me as a pastor. Uh, you know, somebody gets frustrated with pastor, with Pastor Richard. I mean, Pastor Birch can probably, President Birch can, can confess to this. And then instead of dealing with the content, you go around and you attack the character of the pastor rather than the, the content. That's, it is. It's easy. It's, 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 it is. Well, yeah, with me, it's easy. Yes. Tim's like, Tim's like, I criticize Pastor Richard all the time. He sets himself up for it. <laughs> But you see what I'm saying? But, but when you go to the, the, the character of the person, it's what we call an ad hominem, rather than staying on the content. We don't have to do your discipline. Oh my goodness, I'm not going to let this now. For... So for those online, uh, it was just said, we don't have to listen to Pastor Richard, he's just a blimp. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, why is that a bad thing? I'm a blimp. <laughs> um, that makes sense, though, going after the... And it, we have to be very careful because what happens is what Festus did here, by doing an ad hominem, he's actually breaking what? The Eighth Commandment. Yeah, it's the Eighth Commandment. Rather than being on the content of the argument. That makes sense? Okay? Um, but it's so easy, and Tim mentioned it, the reason why uh, we do that is it's it's it's... It's an easy way out to try to win an argument. If you don't like the other person, what they're saying or doing, you just go after their character, and then you what? Diminish their message, right? Now, keep in mind, keep in mind, and we know this from Scripture. Here's a great example. A person can be an absolute jerk, and they can also at the same time still be speaking what? Truth, yeah. Think of this. In the book of Mark, we see this especially. The demons, right? Demons, they encounter Jesus, and they what? They freak out, and they confess accurately, accurately who Jesus is. And they're demons, and they're still what? They're confessing truth out of fear, but they were actually saying what was what? True. And so we, we, we must always put our emphasis on the content of what is being said, rather than going the easy way out, which is what? Ad hominem, which is what Festus did here. Okay? So in other words, <clears throat> so we look at this here. Uh, Festus attacked Paul's character and not Paul's message. And so instead of elaborating on his own character, Paul directed Festus back to the message saying, I'm not out of my mind. Most excellent Festus. You know, I don't know if that's sarcastic or not, but I, I believe it. I believe it is, you know, probably is, is kind back. But I'm speaking the sober truth. In other words, Paul did not attack back and he did, it, and he did, did not exhaustively do, I should put it on there, and he did not exhaustively defend his character, but went back to the validity and truth of his message. So in other words, when the ad hominem came against Paul, he didn't give it the time of day. Because what happens is if you go with the ad hominem, you get what? You want to defend yourself. If you start defending yourself, then guess what? The ad hominem, it worked. You've given into it. Okay? Alas, too often we Christians get sucked into the weeds by defending our own character. Well, there are certain times when our character needs to be defended. Responding to an ad hominem attack by defending our character gives into the goal of the ad hominem attack to begin with. Keep in mind that people will often attack the messenger. Okay? Uh, excuse me. Keep in mind people often attack the messenger because they do not have the ammunition or the ability to attack the message. And when messengers defend their character, they are allowing the tactics of the ad hominem attack to work. They're allowing the conversation to shift away from the message, argument, and logic to the person. What do you okay. do then? So what you do? Good question. So somebody attacks you, okay? You say, you know what? That might be true. We'll talk about that later. Let's just go back to our message, right? Okay? Um, <clears throat> I remember one time in a conversation. Uh, this was in a, this was in a, a conference. And I, I, th I irritated a couple pastors when I was speaking at a conference. And it was in the content... And the one pastor raised his hand, and he, and he, and he was trying to point out a discrepancy of that, I, that I apparently made, and he was asking me if I was a liar, and he was going where? He's going after my character, and I said, you know, are you a liar? And it's like a gotcha game. I'm like, of course I'm a liar. I said, you are too. We all are. God help us speak truth. So absolutely, um, God have mercy. And when I lie, if I if I lie without even knowing, or if I do intentionally. I hope people will call me out on it, so I can uh, what repent and apologize. So, what's your point? You know, I think about Paul. He's very. I mean, this is just, um, of all the attacks. The focus really was 
Right? Yeah. Well, think of Paul, Philippians, right? What does he do in Philippians? He goes, <clears throat> I love that in Philippians. He goes, that, that whole little, that little, little match. He goes, hey, let's have a little match. He goes, as far as zeal, guess what? I got more zeal than you as far as, um, you know, uh, uh, Bible memory points. I got more Bible memory points than you. I have more, uh, you know, catechism trophies than you guys have. Um, as far as learned, da 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 da. And he, he, he takes his credentials and he what? His resume, my resume is this big compared to what your resume is this big. I'm more of a what? Zealot than you are. He goes, oh, by the way, this resume is what? The fun word? Scubala, horse dung, compared to the surpassing richness of Jesus. In other words, I don't matter. What matters is Christ. Okay? What matters is Christ. Bo had a comment? I was just going to say that the, the world is now going after the message. And so the, they, the postmodernists would say there is no truth. So they're trying to destroy, discredit the message. Um, and you can see that everywhere. And they do it with, they do it in, with ad hominem ad hom attacks and, uh, and basically say there is no truth. So and they, you can... You can see them not being sober making those arguments. Yeah, right now what Bo is referring to is in our culture right now. What <clears throat> What's going on, this is a big, big conversation to have down the road, but what's going on is there's a rejection of the objectiveness of reality, of what truth is. And so now words don't mean anything. Words are just used as tools for power. So words are, words are just like, if you put it in a boxing match, if you go in a cage match, and words are just used, it doesn't matter what you say, words are just used to what? Hurt and what? Pummel the other person so that you have power and control. So right now in, in our culture, it's not an issue of truth and integrity. What's being pushed in our culture is power and control. And words are just tools to get power and control. And many people are going that way and it's really, really sad, okay? Because it's, 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 it's attacking the word itself. Yes? But when I was pulled over, I did want to argue. <laughs> and I made sure my collar was straight. And so when it rolled the window down, I went. <laughs> so you could really see that. And it didn't help. I still got the ticket. And then. Yeah, and then, and then, and then when my collar didn't work, I realized, uh oh, now I have to say thank you. <laughs> but you're right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a hand back here. Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. They're trying to destroy the definition. But they're after destroying the definition. When you destroy definitions, you can't have discussions. You can't even. The basis for any discussion is defining your terms and understanding what the terms are, and then you can argue on the validity of them. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So, what's happening, what you guys are saying is, is what they're saying is this. Is okay. So, what is this? Yeah. Pen. That's your okay. So, <laughs> so if we're going to debate if this is the best pen in the world, we would have to use. Okay, we and this is what we do oftentimes. And, and I try to do this when I do presentations. Uh, if I go speak, when I give a presentation, like at Higher Things this summer, I do a presentation at Higher Things. The first segment of Higher Things, I'm going to define my terms. So I'm going to define my terms. These are the words that I'm going to use, and this is what I mean by those words. So that we have an objectiveness on what the words mean. So if I say, what is this? We say pen. And somebody says, no, that's not a pen. That's a horse. You say, okay, now we, we, we should move on in the conversation because we should all agree upon what? What that word means. And so what's happening right now is it's power and control. So if I say this is a pen and you want to win an argument with me, you're going to have to have the power and control to define it how you want to define it according to your own purpose. So you actually say, this is not a pen, this is a horse, and then you can act, actually use those words to your advantage for power and control. That makes sense? So once again, yep, go ahead, Wally. Uh, according to the leftists, this is not 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's switching back and forth. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Again, that's power and control. Yep. Um Yeah. Yep, you change the rules. Yeah. Yeah. It's like playing chess with my grandma. I won all the time. I never lost with chess with my grandma because the rules would change. She's, oh, that's how we play. She's so gracious. And I would just demolish her every time. So the rules changed for me, for my advantage. Yeah. Okay. In the end, what we see is an innocent man being put on trial for death because he would not bend to the sentiments of the crowd. Bluntly stated, the church of Cain will always attack the church of Abel. It is never content, but thirsts for blood because it lives off works righteousness. To deny or snub and or not affirm the works righteousness of the church of Cain is to invite certain persecution and possibly death. Now, we, I want to be very, very serious with you. Last Sunday, we had eight confirmants and they stood up. And they confessed what? That they would hold to the Christian faith even in the face of what? Death. Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm trying not to let my anger come out here, but when I hear people talking about confirmation as like a graduation or just like, nah, it makes my blood boil because it's when we stand up there, it's what? Confessing unto death that you would bleed and die for this. That's what it means. And so being a member of the church is not, not being a member of a social club. We are here together as brothers and sisters saying that we would bleed and die for this Christian faith. And that is the, that is the truth that we cling to, the truth that defines us here at the church, St. Paul's. Okay? That we're willing to bleed. And um, the past 50 years, we haven't had to bleed a lot in our society as Christians but I think that's changing. And I think the next 50 years, we're going to have to learn to bleed. And I may not have to bleed um, as much as my children, but I think my children will bleed more than I will have to. And so for those of you in the church right now, the, those older older individuals, um, my encouragement to you is, is to look to our youth and to encourage our youth, and you're already doing this, to continue to encourage our youth and, and to confess Christ to them so that when the going gets tough and when they're your age, they will remember back when they were what? Teenagers and, you know, Grandma Sally or Grandma, you know, uh, Grandma Jane or, you know, came up and said, you know what? Stay steadfast in the faith, even unto death, right? And we, 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 we stay the course. And that's what I love about our anchor out front. And that's from our centennial, I believe, right? I think it's just perfect. It's just so perfect. St. Paul's, we have a brick building with bricks, right? We know that from, if it was hay, it would blow down. If it was wood, it would, you know. But the wolf can't blow the what? Brick down. And we got a big anchor out front. Those are kind of, we have good historical liturgy. All these things are what? We're not sticks in the mud. We're anchored, right? We're anchored for the storm that's coming. And uh, I believe there is a storm coming. And we're going to have to learn what? By God's grace to be steadfast, even unto death. Yeah, like Paul. Okay? All right, let's stand and pray and uh, go from there. Thanks, you guys. Let's pray here. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all of my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things, let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. All right, amen. Thank you, guys.